How everybody doing tonight? I like that. She said, I'm okay. We're just being honest, right? Amen. Well, you came to the right place. How about that? So I'm pretty sure many of us in here felt I'm okay. The church is a hospital. That's where you're supposed to go. Better than going to a club or a bar or some fake friend that's going to lead you astray. It's good to see everybody. Um, I thank God for this opportunity for allowing us to come together once again another Wednesday night. Let's finish off where we started. <laughs> Because last week, I don't know where we went. I don't even know if we went to slide number two or whatever. Um, let's pray we finish today, right? You know, I always look at it in a sense, if we didn't finish, it's something that we missed in the first half. So God says, okay, let's do it again. So I pray that the message uh, comes to you. Uh, it revives you. And, and like that song said, man, let it uh, ignite a fire down in your soul for the Lord Jesus. Um, let us pray first. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord Jesus, to go ahead and just speak before your people, Lord Jesus. I pray for the hearts that are in this place, Lord God. I pray for their minds, Lord, for it to be at peace, Lord Jesus. I don't know where, where they're struggling. I don't know what they're dealing with, but you do, Lord Jesus. I pray that this message, Lord Jesus, comes to them as a fresh revelation, Lord God, to bring them back to life, Lord Jesus. Whether they're in a dry place, Lord Jesus, allow them to thirst after you in the word of God, Lord. I pray that it gives them a, a new refreshing, Lord Jesus. Uh, just ignite their, their, their walk back on fire, Lord Jesus, whether they're stagnant or, or dry. Whatever it is, Lord Jesus, you know what they need, Father God. So I ask that you use me to feed your sheep in the name of Jesus, Lord. If they came with confusion, doubts, whatever it is, Lord God, I pray that their questions are answered. I pray those that are watching us online, Lord Jesus, maybe for the first time, maybe they, they, they're, they're reoccurring, Lord Jesus. I pray that this message meets them as well, Lord. And I pray that the Spirit of God meets them wherever they are, Lord. And for these that are in this place, Lord, allow them to have attentive ears, not to just listen, Lord God, but to take and to apply. Use me, Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So last week we started, um, we started 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As we started 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we probably deviated a little bit um, according to uh, like what we was specifically talking about because a lot of things were mentioned about drinking and smoking and all this other stuff that we get into. But I thank God that um, this is a church that you can ask questions because answers are provided. Amen? Amen. And um, I, I do look at it in the sense of there, we, there is a generation like us that have a lot of uh, questions and um, the word of God does provide answers. So um, as we get into it, we started in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verses 1 to 11. The message I titled it, this is no time to be asleep. Why is it no time to be asleep? Because I do believe that the coming of Christ is near. I do believe that what we're witnessing around the world, the, the, God is preparing the world for the coming of his son. I do believe that with all my heart. So the emphasis I made last week, I started off by saying Jesus Christ both unites and he also divides. Y'all remember that? Jesus unites and he also divides. Those who have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior are united in Christ as children of God. According to Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, we are all one in Christ Jesus, meaning there is no separate entity. We align ourselves with God as children of God. Therefore, when God sees us, he sees us as Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. See, when, when we are members of one body, that's what the Bible says. So when Jesus does return in the air, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we will be gathered together and we will never be separated from him again. Amen? That word amen means so let it be. I don't know about y'all, but I want it to be. <laughs> amen. So even that faith in Jesus not, um, not only unites to us to other believers, but it also divides us from the, from the tactics of the enemy, but it also separates us from the people of the world. Meaning you look different than the other individuals who are not saved, who do not know Christ. And that's one of the main emphasis in, in, the, in the, the, the letter in itself of 1 Thessalonians. He talks about it all the time. And we would read again that he says, you are no longer in darkness if you are a son of the living God. 
or a daughter of the living God. Jesus says, there are not of this world. John chapter 17, he says, even as I am not of this world, we are separate of the world. Therefore, our character should match that of Jesus Christ and not our own selves. Amen? Amen. So even this, it says... Last week, I talked about how in this specific letter, Paul was encouraging them to live wholly separate lives so they don't have to look like the individuals that are of the world in their pagan generation. So in ours is our cultural generation, or should I say our culture um, perverted nation that we live in today. So he called us to live separate, set apart, different. Don't look like the people of the world. Look different. I need you to look different. How can we do that? By following and obeying the commands of the Lord. So even as Paul was not so much talking to the Thessalonians about being watchful, he didn't want them to be watchful because he wanted them to be consistent with their holy living, consistent with their call, consistent with their status of being children of the living God. Do you remember when I said that last week? We are called to be consistent as far as an individual who is consistent is an individual who is keeping watch. Meaning we don't have time to be backsliding. We don't have no time to be lukewarm. We don't have time for any of that. Why? Because this is no time to be asleep. So even this, um, there's a difference between being ready to go to heaven and being ready to meet the Lord. I said that last week. Anyone who has sincerely trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior for the, and, and, and as far as uh, receive salvation, they're ready to go to heaven. Right. But then I also says because they accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But I said, but the, um, to be ready to meet the Lord at judgment is, is something quite d- different. Why is it quite different? Because we would have to give an account for our Christian walk. I emphasized last week, first John chapter two, verse 28 said that scripture indicates that many people would not be happy to see Jesus when he comes back. Why? Because a lot of us are too attached to the world. We're too attached to our, 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 our material things. We're too attached to our careers. We're too attached to our, our spouses. And none of us are in love with Christ. We have an infatuation with Christ. So therefore, when we see him, we're not happy that the sky cracks open and he's calling us home. Right? So the, the text that says that, it says, now little children, abide in him. That is a command. We know that because in the book of John, it emphasizes to abide in him. Right. We, we are called to abide in Christ. The more you abide in him, the more you are detached from the things of this world. So he says, abide in him that when we shall when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. Meaning there's many Christians that are going to be ashamed when he come and see them, because when they see him in judgment, they will have nothing to show forth. How crucial is that? Like, how, how scary is that? Like, I have nothing to show you, but. The fact that I went up to the altar that one time to say, Jesus, I want you as my savior. That to me, that's a scary thing to see God almighty and have nothing to show for your Christian walk. Like the God that snatched you from hell, like the the God that, that, that gave you life, the God that says that I make all your mercies new every day. That God, you have nothing to show for nothing. That's a scary thing for our generation. I believe that there's a lot of individuals that are going to see him face to face and have nothing to show for In fact, the Bible says that individuals could even lose their rewards. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Pastor Dan's going to talk about that on Sunday. How to lose, if you lose your rewards and gain your rewards and and, and, and the judgment seat of Christ. So you could tune in on Sunday. See, it's been more than, I would say, 20 centuries have come and gone since Jesus promised that he will come back and he has not returned. So a lot of us hear this emphasis in the state of, I want to bring some enlightenment to you. It, uh, people hear that and be like, my grandma been saying this, my gra- all, this, all these other things as if God is slow to his promises. The scripture says that he doesn't want no one to perish, but all to come to repentance. So you should be on your knees thanking God that he ain't come yet. Because if we could be honest, a lot of us in this room probably fell into temptation, probably fell into our sin. And if he would have caught us in that moment, woo, nothing to show for But you mad at the people that mock and scoff you like, oh, where's this coming of your Lord? The Bible says that individuals would do this in the last day. Therefore, when they do this, look up because redemption draws near. My brothers and sisters, we as Christians should be billboards for the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in a perverted generation where they're telling you and they're giving you offering you other gods. That is not the real God. The scripture always identified Jesus or God as um, the God and never as a God because there is no other God. There is only one king, one Lord, one who died on the cross, took on flesh, and his name is the Lord Jesus, and he's coming back again. Are you ready for that? 
Like there's a difference of knowing about God, but there's a different feeling and confidence that you can get when you have an intimate relationship with him. Man, look, I know life is hard. I know circumstances, things happen. I know trials happen. I know sometimes we don't even feel it. Like you wake up in the morning, your emotions are in the way. Like I get it. Me too. The one preaching to you, me too, because I'm in the same sanctification process you are in. But there's a difference of acknowledging that this is not how I should feel and I, I should submit myself to God because there's, there's something that I'm lacking or there's something that I need. And that need that you need is, is God. So, so even this, with, with that being said, um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as is one day. You know, when I read that specific text, right? It, it, it just prompts me to, to just, just to look at it from this sense. Like, we look at God made a, Jesus made a promise 2,000 years ago. But in the eyes of God, because God is not within our time frame, right? That happened two days ago. That happened two days ago. Seven days ago, in God's calendar, seven days ago, he created man. Seven days ago, seven days ago in the calendar of God, seven days ago, he created man, man fell, he created, he, from, he fell, they fell into sin, God caught, cast them out of the, 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 the garden of Eden seven days ago. So to, in the eyes of God, sin is still fresh to God. So it, it, you, it just happened. But to us, we look at it as a historical fact when in God, it's like, this just happened yesterday. Right. And so it says a day is a thousand years to God. So Jesus says two thousand odd years ago, I am coming soon. Jesus said two days ago he was coming soon. My brothers and sisters, God is beyond our time. Two days ago, we crucified Christ on the cross. The, The wounds are still fresh in the eyes of God. You know what that tells me? It makes me it makes me want to repent and call out to God. You know what else that tells me? It tells me that God does not operate based off of our calendar and what we, what we come up with, our own concept of what, what, what we think God is. God is beyond what we can even think. Yeah. Right? And I'm going to paint a picture for you because when I was in Israel, um, one of the things that impacted me the most was the fact that the streets were still buzzing as Christ was crucified yesterday. So if Israel is still buzzing about something that happened 2,000 years ago, imagine how fresh it is to God. And and I'm not even lying to you. Literally, you go to the area where he was born, they're talking about him as if he was born. You go to Jerusalem, he is is prominent. They're talking about him everywhere as if this Jesus was just died, he died yesterday. Like the the streets are buzzing in Israel. It it, it actually, it may change my perspective and it actually changed my life to want to honor the word of God even more. That these people are talking about God and they're talking about Christ as if it, this just happened. They have news articles just coming out, always talking about God, always talking about Jesus, always talking about the Jewish culture, always talking about all these things. But when we come to our America, we're so, uh, we're so infatuated with ourselves and our own ambitions. And, 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 and feed me, Pastor, what I need to know to encourage, to keep going and, and chase after luxury things and, and be happy. A right? A, a lie. And, and, and it's sick. I'm going I'm to be honest with you. You're sick. That's why the churches are more of not hospitals, they're funeral homes. Because they're dead. Dead Christians. You walk in there, they're dead. No one has a spirit. Everybody just want to have a good time. They walk out of there. They go to the clubs. They do everything. They're dead. They, uh, they have this virtue of, oh, we love each other. We love each other when it's an act of compromise. It's fake. It's a fake love. Because a real love never, never wavers. It's, it's a sacrifice love, right? The other love that they're talking about, that virtue of love, anybody can have that love. I love what the scripture says. He says, he says man, um, a man that could give his son good gifts, what you think our father can give? He says, a man who is a sinner can give good gifts to his kid. Imagine what a holy father can give you. Difference. Any man can give good gifts, even if he's evil, the scripture says. So when, when, I, when I read these things and, and, and I sit back and I reflect, man, on, on how um, just relevant Scripture is to our day-to-day life, like it's nothing in comparison to the way that God feels about us as individuals. Like, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son, watch this, two days ago to die for you. Two and a half days ago. 
Like, I, I just look at it as in the sense of, um, man, I just, I just could picture how God just waiting there or he's just so patient, man. Like, oh, my son fell, man. I hope he just comes up and he repents. Oh, my daughter just fell. She just did this. I just pray that she comes and repents to me. I'm just waiting for you to call out to me. That's all you have to do. And I'm ready to heal you. I'm ready to comfort you. Right. And, and Will was telling me about a text earlier today and it, it just brought more of just gave me a, a, another perspective when Will was telling me he was asking me about um, the Beatitudes when he says those who mourn will find comfort. And I was I was explaining to him that when he says mourn, he's talking about individuals who are literally crying and dying over their sin. Like coming to a sense of repentance it has nothing to do with an individual who died. Literally, if you're in your sin, you're already dead. So he's saying those who mourn, who comes to him in the humility, crying out to me, like crying, mourning over their own personal sin. He says, guess what? You would find comfort. Like I would come and I would heal you. And in and, and, and that moment, the Bible says that he would revive you. Like you, it, it's a new life. You know, the reason why a lot of us are keep falling into our habitual sin, because a lot of us are not mourning over our sin. You, you still looking at it like, oh, God, forgive me. Let me do this again. You have not yet, you have not looked at the sin, like in the, in the sense of you're literally dying, like death. Romans chapter 13, verses 12 to 13. I'm going to read this scripture to you because it says that, um, it says the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. Listen to this. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes. How many of us wear dirty clothes? Y'all bet not raise your hand. Oh, what came? Hey, came will raise your hand. Oh, I love the transparency. Don't do that again, daughter. Um, so remove your, de- um, your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. I love that. Put on the shining armor of right living. I love the fact that it emphasized shiny armor because there's a difference when you're different. There's a difference when you're different. Like, people see the difference. Like, what is so special about this person? Right? And then it says this, and it says, because we belong to the day. What's the opposite of day? We belong to the day, meaning we shine. All eyes on me. Tupac voice. It says, because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all, watch this, to see. Meaning we're supposed to be placed on display. People are supposed to look at us. I'm going to tell you, man, if nobody feel condemned or feel judged when they're by you, <laughs> you ain't shining enough. It says don't um, participate in the darkness, watch this, of wild parties and drunkenness. Ooh, that hit me off. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or quarreling and jealousy. That word quarreling means you're talking about people, gossiping about people, always complaining, always got something to say about the service, always got something to say about that person, but really inside is jealousy. I'm just jealous of that person's walk, right? In other words, this scripture is telling us that we need to be prepared because the day of the Lord is approaching it's time to wake up, clean up, watch this, and dress up. Because the, 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 bride is, the, the groom is coming for the bride. Right? If we have ever trusted Jesus, then your future, if we never trusted Jesus, then your future is actually judgment. And not a well done, my good and faithful servant. But we need not to be ignorant to the truth of God's word. Because the word of God gives us the truth on how to really live as Christians. Right? And then even this... Um, We need not to be unprepared because at the same time, the the Bible clearly says that the mercies are made new every day. So meaning if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation, meaning you can be prepared today. Like don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until next year. Don't wait until right now, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're watching right now, the day of salvation is today. I want to give you a, a question that I want you to write down if you can. I'm going to say it fast, but I'll just w- put it in whatever words you want to put it in. Why should we live? Why should we live for the cheap, sinful experiences of this world when you can enjoy riches of salvation in Christ Jesus? Why should you live for the cheap, sinful experience, meaning it's just a moment of time? 
Once that thing fades, once you get that right guy, you hop into a next guy and the next guy and the next guy because you have this void that you're trying to fill. Same thing with a guy. You lay down with this girl, this girl, this girl, you still feel empty. You, you get one cute girl and you be like, man, she fine, I'm good. Then you see another girl that look better and you be like, oh, I got to get her too. Let me forget this girl because she don't, she don't turn me on no more, right? Sinful experiences, they, they fade. Like those things, they're fleeting, But you can experience riches in the salvation that God provides to you in Christ Jesus alone. My brothers and sisters, what I want to exhort to you all is that it's okay to live holy. Watch this. What what God called us holy. That even sounds blasphemy. It sounds sinful. I'm holy. You know what I did yesterday? Yes, you're holy if you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says you are called to be set apart. Now act like it and walk like it. Watch this word, believe it. The reason why none of us are set apart or living as we're set apart, because we simply don't believe it. Now turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verse uh, 1. We'll go ahead and start reading, and I pray that we can get through it. If we don't, that means we got to do it third time, right? No, nah. nah, we're going to get through it today. I don't know about y'all. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses uh, 1 to 11 I'm going to be honest, I can't wait till we get to that second half next week. I believe that second half is going to bless us. Oh, no, but no, the second half of, of chapter five. Oh, we're going to second Thessalonians as well, but that's a new series. Leave me alone. Um, so it says chapter five, starting at verse one. And, it's, and it starts off like this. It says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. I emphasized last week that Paul was only with this set of group for three weeks. Within this three-week span, he thought it was very important to teach these individuals about the coming of Christ. You know, it bothers me, if I could be honest, this is my personal conviction and my righteous indignation, if you will. Right. I get mad to the fact that I don't see how churches are not preaching Bible prophecy when he only was with them for three weeks. But he thought it was very important to teach them the coming of Christ. So meaning individuals or churches that are not teaching the coming of Christ or prophecy in itself is keeping their congregation in the dark. That's why a lot of the churches are living the way that they live. Individuals are living like where they live because they have no proper reverence of the coming of Christ and who God really is. So he thought it was very important to teach them. And in fact, scripture, he says, he says, you perfectly know, meaning I taught you very well. Like, you know about this very well about the coming of Christ. And then we know in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus actually, uh, he actually uh, rebuked the, the religious leaders, individuals who knew the Torah, who knew the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, if you will. He knew they knew the first five books and these individuals could quote scripture like nothing, right? But they could not discern the times. So he rebuked them like you can't even discern the times. You could quote scriptures all you want, but you can't see that I am the Messiah that you're quoting. Like you, you got all, you got, you're just fooled with the, the, word, the word of God, right? You're just this religious person. You're so fooled with it, but you cannot discern the times. That's why it's very important for us to intake scripture, study scripture, so we could discern the times that we're living in. I could tell by the way you live your life that you are not discerning and you're not in the scripture. Because if you are in the scripture, you could see on the news, you could see just life in general that we are living literally in the last days, my brothers and sisters. So even them, Paul was anticipating the coming of Christ. Like he, he lived with expectations of the coming of Christ. Not knowing if he was going to see it or not, he just wanted to be ready and prepared. So the exhortation of this scripture in general is for us as Christians to be ready and prepared. Right? So he says this. He says, he says you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the light. The, the day of the Lord is actually an Old Testament reference, right? The Old Testament reference meaning the day of judgment, the day that God judges the world, right? Even the, the, um, the, the word time in itself is the Greek word chronos, right? Where we get the word chronology from, meaning a duration of time. 
Meaning it's not just one specific time, meaning there's a time period that the wrath of God will be poured upon the earth. And if you're a scripture reader and you study scripture, you would know that the emphasis is the seven year tribulation that he's talking about. Right. So when he goes like this, he says that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night for when they say peace and safety. I love this because he uses pronouns to separate us from the people of the world. He says they he didn't say we. They meaning those that don't believe. You know what else this tells me? It tells me that it's going to be a tragic day for the unbeliever on this day. Why do I say that? Because he says this. He says, for they say peace and safety and then sudden destruction comes upon them. It is going to be a tragic day for the unbeliever at that time. My brothers and sisters, I believe that we're closer than we ever, when, than we ever before. Why do I say that? Because if we look at everything and how everything is lining up and how everybody is just, man, our generation and everything that we're living in, everything that we stand for as a nation, man, is so perverted and it's so um, anti-God that it's impossible for, for Scripture not to be coming into fruition as far as the coming of Christ. Like, like, you cannot study Scripture and not come across a passage that is not talking about today. Like, you can't. I, I, I question you if, you if you tell me that you're reading scripture and you don't see what's happening in the world today aligns with what we're reading. Right? And it goes this. It says, for they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon, uh, um, upon a pregnant woman. Meaning it, it, it suggests that it's inevitable and unexpected. It will come. Inevitable in the meaning it's going to happen regardless. You can't stop it. Unexpected meaning you don't know when it's going to happen. Meaning God wants us to be, God doesn't want us to know the day because he wants it to happen unexpected, but he wants us to be prepared for the unexpected. We're called to be prepared for the unexpected. Those who live their life set apart would be expecting this to come. Like they would be expecting the coming of Christ. In fact, they would have such a, a high reverence or, or um, expectancy or anticipation of the coming of Christ. Like, I can't wait till you come back type feel. Right. And so he says this, he says, they will come upon you like a woman and they, um, yeah, like a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the dark or in the darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. It would not overtake you. The emphasis is to be ready, readiness. Right. And then it goes this, it says, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are of we are not of the, um, the night or the darkness. To be a son of something is to be characterized by that something. If we are sons of the living God, our character should match the living God. Why? Because he says we are sons of light and sons of the day. Meaning we shine bright, we are set apart. We don't look like darkness, we don't participate in darkness, we don't dwell in darkness. And this is not a legalistic thing. This is not something that in my mind, um, okay, I got to check this off my list. I'm not doing this. No, no. Naturally, with your intimacy with God, your relationship with God, this would be natural Christian living. Like you would do this automatically. If you can't do this and you find yourself in a place of struggling, then you need to, you need to sit back and evaluate your Christian walk and say, God, why am I not getting it? Or we read scripture as search my heart, God. Show to me, reveal to me these things. Why I'm not getting it. Understand, man, if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. If you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. That's why it's called deception. That's why you get offended when people tell you something. Because you're deceived. Because you created your own doctrine. You created your own gospel. A compromised gospel. You think I could live this way and still do this but still worship God. False doctrine. Lies. From the enemy. And then it goes this. It says, but you brethren are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, meaning active and aware. Be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night. The, the, the scripture in the, in the sense of, of that word sleep means ignorance. Someone who is uh, spiritually dead, someone who is spiritually indifferent, someone who's different than an individual who is aware. So he's telling you it's not in the sense of sleeping as in dead, as in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. No, he's talking about, now he's talking about morality, 
an individual who deliberately wants to sin and wants to chase after things that are not gratifying to God in your walk. So when he says this, he says, sleep at night, but those who, who get drunk are drunk at night. And he says, but let us who are of the day be sober. I love that word sober because it means someone who has a proper understanding of something of high value. Someone who has a proper understanding of something with high value. Meaning someone who doesn't get excited for the next good thing. The next, the next adventure, the next high, if you will. Like someone who doesn't, who, who, who sees the things of the world as things that are fading away, things that are going to die. Like, I don't get excited for um, a new car. I don't get excited for that. Like, it is what it is. I got a car. Thank you, God. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not looking for the next high because I'm fully aware and, and, and my mind is fully focused on what God has for me and not what the world has for me. So when it goes this, he says, um, and then he goes Those who get drunk are drunk at night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. I love that he says the breastplate of faith and love because um, no Christian is equipped to live the Christian life without faith and love. No Christian is equipped to live the Christian life without faith and love. And then this is not to replace Ephesians chapter six, where he says, put on the full armor of God. No, no, this is a different reference because a Christian who is active in his Christian walk automatically carries himself with faith and love. But then he emphasizes and he says that as a helmet, the hope of salvation. I love that word hope because that word hope means I have a confidence and I have a confidence. It's not a um, it's not wishful thinking It's a confidence in the hands of God that he knows all things for the future. Meaning I have so much confidence in God that he knows the beginning and the end of my future. Therefore, my hope and salvation is in him alone and not of the things that are passing away. Why do I say that? Because he says this, for God did not appoint us to wrath. I know what God, I know that what the future holds. Therefore, I'm being prepared and ready for what the future holds. So if he says God did not appoint us to wrath, meaning wrath is coming. That's what it means. It means wrath is coming. Not only did it mean wrath is coming, it means that if he says he did not appoint us to wrath, it means that what Christ has done on the cross for us, right? Since we trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, we will not experience the wrath of God. So for individuals who have this concept of saying we're going to go through the great tribulation, which is the day of judgment, which is the wrath of God, I, I, I beg to differ because the Bible says we're not appointed to that. So therefore, when Jesus was on the cross, he took on our wrath for our sin. He, the Bible says God poured his whole wrath for present sins, past tense sins, whatever sin, he took it all. Meaning we will not experience it because we're not, a, we're, not, we're, not, um, we're not appointed for it. He says, but he says, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, I love this because it goes back to die and sleep. Now sleep, he's talking about literally your death. But I love that Jesus died so we could experience sleep. So we don't have to experience death. In the sense of when he speaks about dying, meaning gruesome death in the Greek. Meaning he died tragically. So Jesus died tragically so we could experience, watch this word, sleep. Because the Bible says it's appointed for all men to die and immediately comes judgment. But those who are in Christ Jesus go straight to the, to the kingdom of God. To give an account for their Christian life, but not for their sins. And then it goes this, and it says, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. I love that um, the promise of unity cannot be broken. The promise of unity cannot be broken. He says, whether we awake, whether Jesus comes in the rapture and takes us away, or whether we die before the rapture of the church, he says that unity with Christ cannot be broken. Meaning we are forever with him, no matter what. Right? Why? Because we trusted him in his sacrifice on the cross for the remissions of our sin. I love the fact that it emphasizes, it says, died for us. Meaning, Jesus did not come and he, he did not say, um, Jesus was the actual substitute. This was not like a volunteer thing. He said, no, I'm going to take it for them. It's a substitution. Right? This was not a, some type of volunteer, like, okay, uh, let me just do this for them as they could get on with life. No, no, I'm going to die for them substituting, because I'm going to take your place, because you're supposed to be on this cross. 
And then it goes, and it goes, um, we who died, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should live with him together. Therefore, he says, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. That word edify means to build up. The more we build um, children of God up, or the more we build our brothers and sisters up in Christ, the Bible says that God would edify us. You know what this tells me? It tells me that the body of Christ should be involved in every obstacle or every avenue of the church. There is no background. Everyone is called to the front line. You, there ain't no, let me play in the back. No, everyone is called to make disciples, right? Because we're not, um, we are not called to be, uh, we are called to be active participants and not sideline spectators. Active participants in the body of Christ and not sideline spectators. Individuals who always got something to say about somebody else and they walk, but they not building no one up. People always tell me, man, hey, pastor, man, I want to um, I, I want to do something, man. I, I want to do something. I want to serve at the church. Right. But and, and I feel like I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know what God calling me to do. He's calling you to edify your brothers and sisters. Comfort somebody. Pray for somebody. Like when was the last time you prayed for somebody other than you and your family? All right. When was the last time you bruised your knees for something that just happened on the news? The, the people were just killed. Eight people in a in a in a spa, if you will. Like, when was the last time we prayed for something like that? Nothing, because none of us have burdens. We're so, we're so selfish with, with our Christian walk. And if we could be honest, like, let's be honest. We are called to be full participants and not sideline spectators. Meaning, when I see something wrong, I'm immediately falling on my knees to pray. When I, when I know my brother and sister is down, let me edify them. Let me build them up in prayer or build them up in a conversation or build them up to encourage them. You know, even sometimes you don't even have to say nothing and just be there. That's all, we, that's, that's all some of us need. Just be there. Or uh, I'm praying for you, brother. Like th- those are the best words I can hear from somebody. Like I'm praying for you. Really? You praying for me, man? Like I, I don't like when people, when I say I'm praying for you, don't say, I'm, well, whatever. I say when I'm praying for you and they say, well, I'm praying for you too. I know you ain't praying for me. Stop all that lying, man. Stop all that lying, man. It's like, it's okay to receive that somebody praying for you. Don't, don't come with that false humility. I'm praying for you too. No, you're not. It's okay. Like, it's okay. Just receive it. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. You know? So let's get to the slides, right? <laughs> so Paul pointed out the contrast between believers and unbelievers. First, he... Um, he, he pretty much what he did was he gave knowledge and he talked about ignorance, expectancy and surprise, soberness and drunkenness, salvation and judgment. So he points out between believers and unbelievers because there is a difference in scripture. A lot of us in this room will probably see ourselves in that side of ignorance. It's OK. You still have time to come back to God and repent because he's waiting for you. But and please don't get too self-righteous as if you're in that place of knowledge because you too could be deceived. So it's very important for us in this room to take down notes because I do believe that if we're, we're called to do the message one more time, there's something we miss, so we should take down notes. Amen? Amen. So knowledge and ignorance, that's the first thing we're going to go over. Knowledge and ignorance, three phrases, uh, yeah, three phrases and careful considerations. One is times and seasons. This phrase is found only three times in the Bible in the reference primarily, primarily to God's plan for Israel. This is the day Daniel stated when he gave understanding of the king's dream in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. If you go back to the scripture, Daniel and himself, he talks about the day of the Lord. He talks about the seven-year tribulation. But then it gets to a point in the book of Daniel that God says, yo, 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 wait, wait, don't say no more. I don't need you to write nothing else. Why? Because he knew that John in the New Testament was going to finish the revelation of God. So in the book of Revelation, it coincides with the book of Daniel. So if you want to do an intense study, you read the book of Daniel, and then you you compare it to the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation finished off the book of Daniel. So this is the the way Daniel stated it when God gave him understanding of the king's dreams within times and seasons. So our our Lord's use of the phrase in Acts chapter 1, 7, in, yeah, yeah, 1, 7 indicates that times and seasons relate primarily to Israel. God has a definite plan for the nation of the world, and Israel is the key nation. 
Um, last week, I, I emphasized that the end time clock started May, May, 20, May 1948 when Israel became a nation. Because before that, Israel wasn't solidified as a nation until it came into fruition May 1948. The moment it became a nation, God appointed, he, he looked at it, okay, this is where it starts. Time is ticking for the coming of Christ. We, we look at it like, man, that was a long time ago. We in 2021, what I told you, our days are not like God's days. God doesn't run on our calendar. God is outside of time. He controls time. He knows everything. He knows how it's going to end, how it started. He knows the beginning and the end. He knows the cracks and the crevices. He knows everything. You cannot hide from God. We cannot hide from God. We cannot alter anything from God. I believe that, um, I be you got to understand something. So um, Jerusalem was not destroyed yet. So Matthew 24, Jesus gave a prediction. The prediction was that this, this city was going to be destroyed, right? It, that was only, Paul wrote this letter about 30 years after, right? So I would say, in fact, yeah, in fact, yeah, 30, about 30 years after. So even Jerusalem in itself, it was destroyed AD 70 and it was never picked up again. So there was no more sacrifices. There was no more nothing. Everything was scattered until May 1948 when they all came back. So in that time, there were so, I believe that it was so fresh for them. It's like, yo, I'm going to anticipate the coming of Christ. I just could imagine the fire. So imagine like an individual like Paul who was appointed to preach to the Gentiles. Imagine him on fire. You see signs, you see wonders, you see miracles because it's the edification of the church at that time. Right? Imagine you're seeing these things. It's like, yo, I know his words are true, and I know that the, the Jesus that we speak of, the Jesus that we trusted, right, it, it, has, to, it has to be pretty much relevant to um, his coming. Like, I'm expecting his coming, if you will. So I believe a lot of it is because the way Paul ministered to them. I believe a lot of it, it goes to the fact that um, what they witnessed from Paul. You know, as far as his fire, his zeal, when it comes down to him being persecuted, so on and so forth. But a lot of them was also the reason why they had this anticipation, because I told you guys, well, that's in the second half of the new season. Um, there was these individual, this specific group called Judaizers that came over there and, and they pretty much polluted them with a false doctrine, making it seem like they were in a great tribulation when they weren't. So the reason why Paul wrote this letter specifically it's because to straighten out that, yo, this false doctrine among you, individuals are teaching this false doctrine. This is not true. You are not in the great tribulation. Just anticipate the coming of Christ. So the reason why they expected it is because, one, they were being persecuted, like Matthew 24 says. And two, um, they were witnessing false doctrine. It was witnessing all these other things among them, in which now we see it relevant for us because it points to the signs of the time. Does that make sense? So um, God has a definite plan for the nation of the world, and Israel is the key nation. God has ordained times and seasons for the nation on earth, particularly Israel, and all of this will accumulate in a terrible time called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord translate as the day of judgment, meaning judgment on this world. I was reading an article, I see you, I was reading an article that um, recently they asked an individual by the name of John MacArthur. He says that um, you think that it's too late for America to turn back. Um, his, his, his answer was very direct. He said, yes. He said, it's way too late. He says, in fact, what we're witnessing now when they're passing all these laws, he says, you're seeing everything that's happening. He says, this, this is the judgment of God on this nation. He, and he emphasized a quote, a famous quote. He says, that if, he says, if God does not destroy this nation, he owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. So what we're witnessing now in our generation, he says, it is too late for the nation he says, but it's not too late for the elect. Amen. It's not too late for the, the individuals. So in a sense, I told you guys last week, I said, look, we can't change America, but we can change Americans. Individuals. We can. And you're called to. You're called to give the gospel to individuals. Why? Because the coming of Christ is prominent. What we're witnessing in our world today, all these bylaws and everything that's happening is the judgment of God, and you will see it's going to get worse. The expectancy, yes.
Yeah. It's just like it's a blessing to I mean it's a like Paul said, it was like if you expect God's coming, like you're gonna be rewarded for that. And and there's many references in scripture of individuals who anticipated the coming of Christ. Even when Paul died, Paul was decapitated. Then you have John, who John was thrown into oil, who wrote the book of Revelation. He was born literally alive, but he still lived. And then they, they cast him to an island called Patmos. And as he was in the island of Patmos, I'm pretty much pretty sure he was slaving. And as he was slaving, Christ came to him. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He said, write these things down accordingly. So he wrote the book of Revelation. But then in the end of the book of Revelation, he said, something he says amen even so come jesus living with expectancy as i just witnessed the living christ even he lived with expectancy as if i just wrote this not knowing this is for decades or for centuries later i'm living in expectancy as well even so come i can't wait for you to come not knowing that he was going to see the lord jesus and right now he's with him in his glorified in his glorified um nature as far as spiritually Y'all got this? <clears throat> so the second thing is the day of the Lord. In the Bible, the word day um, can refer to a 24 hours period or to a longer time during which God accomplishes some special purpose. The day of the Lord is that when God will judge the world and punish the nations. At the same time, God will prepare Israel for the return of Jesus Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom. Revelations chapter 6 to 19 vividly describes this event. The great tribulation is assigned for Israel and his people, for the Jewish people. We are now currently in a place called the church age, which is called the age of grace, meaning grace is going gonna, is gonna to end soon. I believe that we're at the end of the grace period. And I believe that right now God is calling for his people. There's many testimonies I have witnessed of individuals who are like satanic worship. There were all these individuals. They just felt this prompting that Christ was calling them and they're repenting and leaving their satanic occult things and coming to Christ. I believe that this is a last day revival call, a remnant. I don't believe that it, even if we don't see a revival as a whole, I believe that people are going to be revived literally by themselves, individuals. I believe that I believe that God is calling individuals back. There's individuals that I spoke to that had um, that backslid from the faith. And even them, they said, man, I don't know, man. I just feel this urgency that I need to go back to God. Yeah. Amen. Then go back to God. Yeah. Like we, we as in, understand this, man. Paul emphasized many times in the scripture. He says, man, do not be ignorant of this fact. Like it's going to happen. Just because you're not seeing it happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In the same sense, just because you don't see God, you know that God exists. Yeah. Why? Because it's prominent everywhere. It's, it, you could go outside and you know that God exists. You know man didn't make this. It, it was God. You could look at yourself and how detailed you are from eyebrows, from, from, from your, your taste buds. Like man didn't just create that. God, God the book of Jeremiah says, I crafted you and molded you in, the room, in your womb. In your mother's womb. Like I made you as an individual with a purpose. Therefore you live and you walk out in that purpose. Anything outside of God. All you're going to do is find death. Every time. Literally. Spiritually and literally. Because the Bible says that the enemy in himself. In the book of Revelation. He was cast down to the earth. He says he come in like a, 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 like a in rage. Seeking to devour. Because the Bible says the emphasis added. Because time is short. Even he know time is short. That's why we have all these false doctrines. That's why we have all these false churches that's pushing people astray. Like, man, I seen something so perverted, man. Like I just read before I even walked in here, man. There's an article that's so perverted. Like, like, like mockery of the name of Jesus, man. Talking about, um, talking about this is God's power displayed. And, and I don't mean to gross nobody out, but like the man literally in Africa, he has a mega church and like he's delivering individuals by literally sitting on their faces, bro. And, and, and saying that it is God's power. And I'm, I'm going to say it like he's literally, it's nasty. He's literally farting on their faces and saying that it's God's power. And these people are literally sitting there allowing this little fake prophet to sit on their face and doing that and saying that it's God's power. Like, it, 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 bro, it's not even funny. Like, that's a mockery of the name of Jesus. And then you wonder why the people out on the streets are mocking us and they're not taking Christ serious. Like, this is a mockery of the name of Christ. Like, it is a privilege, man, to wear his name. Do you understand that? Like, 
Like, it, man, when I, when I read that, man, I, I'm going to be honest with you, man, my flesh was like, yo, I wish I had a flight. I'll throw hands with this man. Like, I'll beat that boy. That's the hood side of me. That's my flesh. Y'all pray for me. Because I would beat that boy. Hey, look here, man. Hey, boy. Hey, the old heck came out. Um, yeah, the Bible says the people perish for the lack of ignorance, but at the same time, it's like that man doesn't even know he has to, he's going to give an account for that. Like, he's not even saved. And I'm going to say that blatantly. For an individual to say some perversion, like that, something so disgusting, and he attaches it to the name of God. But that is a mockery. The Bible says God will not be mocked. This man, he, he is literally, he, he, is, he has a reservation straight to the pits of hell if he doesn't repent. He's straight, he going straight there. And literally is a mega church. The perversion. But, it, but, but let me tell you, man, like just because it's happening in Africa, that doesn't mean it, it don't make no difference here in the United States. These churches that are compromising the gospel and these churches that are just emphasizing love, equality, and all these things that is contrary to scripture, that's a mockery to the name of God. But that's another story, man. That's another, that's in a new series that we're talking about. It's called The Great Apostasy. And we're going to talk about that too. It was somebody who had their hand up. Um, when, it, when it comes down to knowing what false doctrine is, that's why it's very important for us to study scripture. Um, I, me, my own personal testimony, man, I've been called a demon because I challenged the pastors in their false doctrine. Literally, with witness, uh, Joyce and Chichi, like literally, they call me, they, oh, he's a demon because he doesn't want you to stay in his church. Because I'm showing them in scripture, everything you're saying is a lie. Like, like literally is a lie. And this is a mega church today that's leading many people astray in Miami. I'm talking about a huge mega church. I'm talking about you got people thinking they on fire. They at the altar crying and all these things. And that's a false emotion because they're going based off of false doctrine. In fact, the, the script, what he teaches is he teaches these individuals to be empowered, to be confident, to be prideful. As if you have some special gift that God needs you. That's the doctrine that he teaches. I guarantee you they already received the true gospel. See, they chose, their, they chose literally, literally they, they chose. So put it like this. Um, does God have individuals in there that he's probably going to take out? I believe that God's going to allow it. I believe, I believe that God says that he turns them over to the, what their wants as well. Romans 1. So at the same time, um, you know what that does for me? Because I'm not even going to speak on it. You know what that does for me? It makes me want to speak out more. For an individual like yourself that knows the truth of the word, it should make you want to sit, sit somebody down and tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And don't leave them in that state. Because we're called to do so. What's up, Jazz? America has, American Christians have no excuse. You know, we're, as far as knowledge, we are the highest in the world beside Israel. Knowledge. I'm talking about like, we have everything available to our hands, tangible. Whether it's um, Google, <laughs> I don't advise everybody to go to Google because there's a lot of false things in there. But whether it's um, a dictionary, whatever it is, we have no excuse. You know how many translations of the Bible we have here in America alone? But then you got people in China, they just wish they had any Bible. You know what I'm saying? 
Like, we have no excuse. That's why I believe what John MacArthur said. This, this, this country is literally we're experiencing the judgment of God. Like, I don't believe it's going to get better. Everybody else could wait till it get better, but it's not going to get better. My expectancy is not in the government or the people. It's an expectancy of the risen king who's coming back. So I believe what Scripture says that God would turn over a country or turn over an individual to their own lust, to their own things and their own desires. I believe that because Scripture talks about it. Even when it comes down to lust, even when it comes down to topics of homosexuality, all those things. Um, um, do I have family members that are homosexual? Yeah, 100%. Do I love them less? No, but I don't condone. I, I, go, I agree with what the Bible says, what it is. That's what it is. And they agree. Like, it, the crazy part is I have close family. I'm talking about like close family, like far off. And they agree. And they, 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 they said, I know where I'm going. Like, they're okay with that. You know, you know what, um, you know, that in itself, man, um, I love when people say that because that's, that's, there's hope. He gave me hope. I don't know about you, but that he just gave me hope. So what I would do, I would pray for that. God cultivate that feeling. Like or allow that feeling to overpower his, his desire for men. You know what I'm saying? Um, I got, I got a close individual that's very close to me and I always talk to him about God and he just have such a high respect for me because I never condemn him. I never do anything. I always tell him the truth in scripture and he always say, he always asks me, man, is it too late for me? Like, like he, oh, that's a question he always asks me. I'm talking about a hopeless feeling. Like he looks at me and he get teary eyed and he tell me like, is, is it too late for me? I said, no, it's not too late for you. I said, you're still alive, right? Today is the day. You know how many times I prayed with this boy? And it's not in the sense of like the like these the, these Pentecostal movement charismatic. Well, I rebuke this demon. No, no, I, we are we're sinful individuals. That is just sin. God to can deal with that sin right there. I don't need to rebuke nothing but pray for you, my brother. Amen. Talk to me. So like, for example, I know hey, this is kind of reverting back. Yeah, go ahead. In that moment, you can't sit there and say that, oh, um, I wasn't told. That's cap. It's on you. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when you say, like, it's kind of late, um, it's very much true. Because if we don't, we'll rather take the easy way out. Like, instead of studying for something, I'd rather go on to it. Why? Why? Because what you used to say, we're well, microwave generation. We want it and we need it. It's my money and I need it now. That's Facts. What, that's what we are. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so it's Yep, exactly. Exactly. That's good. That's good. Um, and to be honest with you, um, my, my burden for false doctrine birthed who you follow. Me seeing so many people fall astray into false doctrine is the reason why I started who you follow. I said, yo, I'm going to open my one bedroom apartment and these people are going to get these answers. They're going to get this word. And we ain't never closed the door since.
Well, I'm glad you ran. How about that? Don't stay in that church. I'll tell you that. Because a, 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 a pastor that does not teach the full counsel of God is a, past, is, is a phony, but is a, past, is a pastor that's going to, he's going to have to see God. I get it. I get it. No, I get. I get what you mean. But when it comes down to like, when it comes down to like, even pr- prophecy in a sense, um, the Bible in itself is made up one fourth of prophecy. So it's impossible to read scripture and not stumble across prophecy and teach prophecy. So if a, a pastor is not teaching it, he's literally cherry picking scripture to give to his congregation to keep them comfortable. That's why they don't talk about topics, hard topics as far as homosexuality, things that are happening, racism. They don't talk about those topics because they want to have people just sitting in their pews. They want people to come, come, come. And I, 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 I promise you, man, if you just sit back and you look at the people that you're listening to podcasts and you compare it to scripture and you see all these people on your Instagram and all these things, all these people, I promise you, man, you're going to see something wrong. If you literally want to search, like you're going to see something wrong. And then, and then when you look at how everyone's falling astray in their church and things are just falling in shambles, it's because the whole counsel of God is not being preached. And there is no reverence for the word of God. A lot of the times it's like my brother um, Jeff Kinley said, he says, TED Talks. They only reference one part of the scripture and the rest is their own opinion. Literally. Let me encourage you with this. Not one time did I see them look down. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Dissect the word of God. They only look at one scripture. It's probably on a TV just like this. And then they walk off with the microphone all over the stage. Amen. 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 I actually know a, a testimony of a man that, that actually he lives that life. He, he, but he, you know, he ended up catching HIV or whatnot. And he was an individual. He says, I was very happy gay. And I think Pastor Dan said this many times. He says, I was very happy gay. He says, but I found something better, which was Christ. And he says, he says, I was very happy as a gay man. Like I didn't want to live another life, but he says, but I found something better was Christ. And now he lived his life literally submitted to God. He don't, he don't fall into his sin. He don't do any of that. And now he goes around the whole country preaching against that movement. No, it's, it's sin. That's what it is. We're, we're living in a fallen world. So it's just sin. According to Romans 1, the Bible says that these individuals are infatuated. Is their lust? Their lust came to another level. And they, they pretty much what happened with that lust, it just spilled over. And God says, okay, I'm going to turn you over to your own lustful desires. And that's Romans 1. If you want to know more about that, read Romans 1. It literally depicts everything that we're seeing in our nation today. Literally. You, you want to know my personal opinion? My personal opinion, I believe it. Because the Bible says that we were born in sin. Therefore, that's why we need to be born again. So I believe it. We're born in sin. It just just justifies that we were born sinners. That's all it does. So so that's the whole reference of Christ said, man, flesh and blood can't get to heaven. He said that's why someone needs to be born again. So yes, I do believe that. All right, no more questions. Let's go over this. 
So the third one is um, a thief in the night. Our Lord used this image in his own teaching. It describes the suddenness and the surprise involved in the coming of the day of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3, he used this image to warn believers not to be caught napping. We are not called to be asleep. We need to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be active for the kingdom of God. So it goes back to we, we're, we're called to be active and, and participants in the church and not sideline spectators. We don't, we don't have time to be sitting there. Oh, he's not doing this. He's not doing this. Like, what are you doing for the kingdom of God? Always revert back to yourself. Stop pointing fingers. That's not what we do in the kingdom of God. We point back to ourselves. Now, if you could talk from a place of victory, therefore, you go to that person and you help them. So it goes back to the people say, man, don't judge me. We're called to judge righteously. But when you judge righteously, you better have a solution. Don't just leave them there. That's another message. We'll get to that too one day. Y'all got this? So um, since we do not know when the Lord will return for his people, we must live in a constant attitude of watching and waiting while we are busy working and witnessing. The suddenness of this event will reveal to the world its ignorance of divine truth. The divine truth is the scripture. And it's going to show you that you are ignorant to the fact that everything was given to you, everything was shown to you, but you chose to ignore the truth. In the facts that were presented to you. Therefore, when you stand before God, there is no excuse. Y'all got this? So the, the next one was expectancy and surprise. The unsaved world will be enjoying a time of false peace and security just before these uh, catechismic events occur. The world is caught by surprise because men will not hear God's word or take heed to God's warning. God warned that the flood was coming, yet watch, only eight people believed and were saved. Like, I, I think of it in the sense of if that if it was that time now, like people say, Man, I get tired of talking about Jesus is coming back and he never comes back. Noah was warning for 100 years. Who am I? You probably been saved for like three years and you over here talking about you, I'm tired of Jesus coming back. This man been saved 100 years telling these people yeah. Jesus is coming back. I'm going to say it's I'm grand old. If he comes back today or when I'm old, I'm still going to be saying the same thing because I live with an expectancy and anticipation of the risen king to come back. Um, Jesus used the flood and the, uh, to, and the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah as examples. People in those days were going um, about their regular daily activities. They were eating, they were drinking, they were getting married, but never considering that the judgment was around the corner. My brothers and sisters, the judgment is literally around the corner. Whether you die or whether he comes back for you or he comes back, judgment is around the corner. We as Christians or individuals who are not believers, today is the day to get right. Right? So no signs must be fulfilled before he can return for his church. Like I told you, we, at, uh, we are in something called the disp dispensation period, the grace period, the, the age of grace. Meaning right now, specifically, he's, pointing, he, he's pretty much building up his church. He's building up the individuals who are in his church. And once that moment, the final Gentile receives Christ as Lord and Savior, trumpet blows, Christ is coming back for his church. His focus goes to the great tribulation with points back to Israel. Christians um, are sons of light and therefore are not in the dark when it comes to future events. Unbelievers ridicule the idea of Christ's return. Second Peter, we are called to live in the light of his return, realizing that our works will be judged and that our opportunities for service on earth will end. The time is now. Don't wait till tomorrow. If you want to serve God, serve him now, not later. It means to live with eternal eternity's values in view. Believers who live in the expectation of the Lord's return will certainly enjoy a better life than Christians who compromise with the world. I'd rather have a peace that knowing that I'm going to go with God. I'd rather someone call me you boring than, than me just living and, and trying to satisfy my flesh with other people partying and doing all that stuff. Knowing I feel this conviction and I choose to ignore it. I'd rather have peace. Then, then, then this thing of, man, dang, I, I messed up again. I don't, I don't like that feeling I messed up again. I don't like that feeling when you fall into sin and you, and you, you feel like, man, I can't even come to God. I can't even pray to God. Like I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I don't like that feeling. Y'all got this? Um, soberness and drunkenness. To be sober minding means to be alert with your eyes open, to be sane and steady. To make the contrast more vivid, Paul pictured two groups of people. One group was drunk and asleep, 
while the other group was awake and alert. Which one are you? Right? So danger was coming, but the drunken sleeper were unaware of it. The alert crowd was ready and unafraid. I want to be ready and I don't want to be afraid of the coming of Christ. Like I want to be ready for the coming of Christ. I remember back in my day when I wasn't, when I wasn't um, saved, I remember being scared like of the coming of Christ. Like I used to tell people, man, don't talk about that. And I remember when they said, oh, the countdown, there it goes, 2,000. I mean, you know, Y2K or whatever it was. And I was a little kid. I was like, no, he's coming. Like, I, I was scared because I knew I wasn't saved. You know, I was a kid and I knew I wasn't saved. So, so imagine now how people feel who heard the gospel, who know about these things, but they choose to ignore it. As Christians, man, we should be ready and unafraid. There's nothing to be scared of. Since we are sons of the day, we should not live as those who belong to darkness. The sober-minded believer has a calm, sane outlook on life. Watch, he is not complacent, but neither is he frustrated and afraid. He hears the tragic news of the day, yet he does not lose heart. He experiences the difficulties of life, but he does not give up. We're not called to give up. If anything, when you find it, when you find yourself in this state, man, lean harder on God. I remember, man, when I used to be on the corners, um, I'm going to say it, I, was, I used to be on the corners selling dope, right? When I was in the world, I used, to be, I used to sell dope. And I remember one of the strategies I used to use was I used to lean against the wall. Every time I serve, I'm leaning against the wall because it gives me a view. I know that nobody's going to come and creep up behind me to try to get me. I know that there's nothing behind me but a wall. I'm always paying, I'm always alert, so I'm paying attention to every look, whether it's the police, whether it's people, that your ops, they're trying to come and get you, they're trying to rob you, whatever it is, I'm always paying attention, so I always lean with my back against the wall, because I'm always paying attention. So in the same sense, when you lean, you lean on God, who is your wall. You stand firm of a foundation, which is Christ Jesus, because when you're leaning, you have a point of view of when the enemy is coming, when and whoever's coming, whatever it is, somebody's going to try to cause you to fall astray. Now your back is against a wall. Your back is stir, um, sturdy on the background of a foundation called God, Jesus. So in that same sense, we lean on a wall, and that wall is the cornerstone, which is Christ. We know the future is um, secure in God's hands, so he lives each day creatively, calmly, and obedient. Outlook determines outcome. And when your outlook is uplook, then your outcome is secure. Outlook determines outcome. When your outlook is uplook, then your outcome is secure. But the unsafe people of the world are not alert. They are like drunken men living in a false paradise, enjoying a false security. It is a false security. In the book of Ecclesiastic, it, it emphasized that this life is, is fleeting. It's like the wind. It comes and it goes. He says, but you can have something that's tangible and something that's real, that's life transforming, and that is the spirit and the power of God living within you. I'd rather have great comfort with God. I'd rather live homeless, but I have God. I'd rather be beat down, but knowing that I have God. I don't care about anything else as long as I have God. I could lose everything now as long as I have God. That's all that, mean, that, that, that's all that matters. They live in a false fantasy, a false security, in a perverted generation. When it comes to the return of the Lord, we must be mourning, we must be mourning people, awake, alert, sober, and ready for the dawning of, of the wonderful new day. For the unsaved um, crowd... Revealing in his drunkenness, the, the coming of Jesus will mean the end of light and the beginning of eternal darkness. That is scary for a lot of people. Like I know people that deliberately, um, when I talk to them about God or I talk to them about things that are happening, political, or whatever it is, and I, and I tie it in with the word of God. A lot of people are like, man, don't tell me, don't, don't tell me that. Because if I don't know, God won't hold me accountable. Literally, they told me that. Like, don't tell me much. Please, if I don't know, God won't hold me accountable. That in itself shows your ignorance. God knows. Like, you can't trick God. He knows you chose to be ignorant. Therefore, he turns you over to your ignorance. Like, that is a scary thing to be in the dark. Like, to want to be in the dark. I want to know things. I, I, these people, like, that's why Paul emphasized, man, y'all know perfectly. He didn't say y'all know a little bit. He said, no, y'all know perfectly. Like, we got to be people that know perfectly when we study scripture, man. The dawning of a new day awaits us. 
For those that are that are living in a, in a state of I don't want to uh, I don't want to obey the scripture, you man, eternal darkness awaits you. Salvation and judgment. This is, these are the last slides. Believers do not have fear have um, have to fear the future judgment because it is not a part of God's appointed plan for us. God did not appoint us to wrath. Christians have always gone through tribulations since this is a part of a dedicated Christian life. But they will go. What they will not go through the tribulation that is not appointed. This, that is appointed for the godless world. Meaning, we will not go through the great tribulation. We will not go experience God's wrath or God's judgment because Jesus took it for us on the cross. So, therefore, our our foundation is built on Christ and what He accomplished on the cross. We will not experience God's judgment or wrath. So, stop self-condemning yourself if you fall into sin. Just fall on your knees and repent. Although if you're God's child, right, and you're living a disobedient life, the Bible says he was chasing you back to him. Why? Because Jesus made a promise to us. He says, I will finish the work that I started within you, meaning I will complete you until I come. I will complete you when I come. You're going to be completed in a sense of your, your salvation will be complete. But he says, I will prepare you for my coming. Five reasons and, and this, these are the last ones, five reasons that I am convinced that we will not go through the great tribulation. I advise you to write it down because you would, you would encounter many scholars and many good believers or many teachers that are, they're, they're good teachers. They don't mean, this doesn't mean that they're not saved or anything. They just believe that we're going to go through the tribulation. I'm convinced that we're not going to go through the tribulation. One of the reasons is that the nature of the church, um, the church is the body of Christ. He is the head. When he died for us on the cross, he bore for us all the divine judgment necessary for our salvation. So therefore, he promised that we would not taste any of God's wrath. So the book of Revelation in itself, it entails God's wrath for the unbelievers, for the individuals who choose to live disobedient lives, for those that trusted Christ as Lord and Savior and are confident in their salvation. And there's uh, evidence in your life that you are changed. You will not go through the great tribulation. You will not experience God's wrath. And for those that don't believe and have not fully trusted, today is the day of salvation. You can make that change today. The second thing is um, the nature of the tribulation. This is the time when God judged the Gentile nation and also purged Israel and prepare her for the coming of their Messiah. The, ki- the earth dwellers will taste of God's wrath, Revelation chapter 3, and not those whose citizenship is in heaven. Why? Because we would not experience the wrath of God. Third one is the promise of Christ's imminent return. The fact that Christ will, Christ, um, the return of Christ is imminent, and there's a doctrine of imminency, meaning Paul emphasized that Christ would come unexpectedly. It proves that we would not experience the wrath of God. And in fact, um, the, word, the word imminent means ready to happen. Nothing has, um, has to occur for Christ's return except, except the calling out of the last person who will be saved and complete the body of Christ. That meaning there is one more individual. Imagine if that individual was in this room. Imagine if you're one of those people that thought you were saved, but you weren't. And today is like, yo, it put a fear in me. Now I give my life to Christ. And God was waiting for you to complete the church age. And then we're just up out of here. Like I always say, man, I always want to be caught. I told y'all last week, I want to be caught doing the work of God. I want to be caught praying for somebody, talking to somebody about God. I want, I want to hear them to hear Jesus out of my lips, and then I see Jesus face to face. Like that's how I want to be caught up. So imagine if that, work, that one person was here today. And the moment you trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we up out of here. So he's waiting for that last person who will be saved, saved and complete the body of Christ. If our Lord did not return for us until the end of the tribulation period, then we would know when he was coming. That's why, one reason why I believe that there is two partials coming. There's one, the rapture of the church, and then the second coming, which is when he really touched his foot on earth. The, so the fourth one is the course of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Like that's a whole message. That's why I didn't just give too much details. I'll emphasize that in our new series to come. Chapter um, number five is the order of events in Second Thessalonians chapter two, which will be emphasized in our new series as well. So Paul connects the return of Christ with the redemption he purchased for us on the cross. We are brought with a price, right? We are his bride and we will and he will come 
to claim us for himself before he sends judgment on this earth. My brothers and sisters, Christ is coming back. Right? God says that he doesn't want anyone to experience wrath. He doesn't want anyone to die. He doesn't want any of that to happen. So therefore, he sent his only begotten son to die in your place as a substitute so that if you, full, if you fully put your trust in him, you will be saved and you will experience life eternal in heaven with him. I pray that this message in itself encourages you and it ignites a fire in you to want to go out there and speak about the coming of Christ. And if you're, not, if you're one of those that, are, that have been living in a, in a shell or in a dark area, right, and, and that don't know anything about the coming of Christ, I pray that this message in itself gives you some type of urgency to want to know more about it, more about him, and to want to anticipate the coming of Christ. In fact, a fruit of being a true born-again Christian is one who anticipates the coming of Christ. So if you want to evaluate yourself, ask yourself, am I too attached to the world or am I attached to Christ? We must remember that Christ died for us, that we might live for him, through him and for him and with him. Whether we live or die, wake or sleep, we are the Lord's and we shall live with him. The truth of our Lord's imminent return shall encourage us to, clean, to keep clean and to do faithful um, and to be faithful or to do faithfully whatever he whatever work he has assigned us to do. We are on mission. Matthew 28 says, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. My brothers and sisters, if you're a born again Christian today, you are on mission. So are you doing what God has called you to do? I pray that this message ignites some type of fire in you. Next week, we will go to the second half of chapter five which I believe it, w- it would probably, man, it will prune all of us in this room. And it was get us. If y'all want, you can read ahead. But I promise you, you're going to miss a lot of things in it because next week we're going we to really go into depth about it. But I pray that because God allowed us, gave us the grace to, to reiterate this same message, I pray that it blessed you. And I pray that it encourages you to walk a holy set-apart life. Amen? So let us pray. Let us get up and pray. So even as the title says in itself, man, it's no time to be asleep. It's time to wake up, Christians. Um, The devil's very busy, as we can see. Uh, If you read news after news or article after article, you can actually see literally how the devil's just moving. He's perverting the church. He's making uh, Christians be the enemy. We're the new, we're the new, uh, how you say, we're the new Holocaust, if you will. We're the new target now. If, 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 and I always say, well, I told my leaders and I probably told you guys before, I believe that the agenda of the new government system is literally they're just following everything that Hitler did. And, 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 and man, we live in some crucial times, man. That's all I can really say. So with our heads bowed, eyes closed, let us go ahead and uh, pray. And I pray that this message blessed um, all of us in this room. I pray that it, it placed the urgency in our hearts. I pray, Lord, I pray that, man, it just, um, it awakens us, man. Whether you was a sleeping Christian, a lukewarm Christian, a backslidden Christian, I pray that it makes you want to just, a, a new desire to want to get in the word. Like that last song that we played during worship, man, it set a fire down in my soul. I pray that it sets a fire down in your soul. I pray that it gives you a, a, a man, just a hunger, man, for God's word. Because God's word will shelter you, literally. It will guide you. That's what the psalmist said. He said it it would guide you. It it would literally lead you in your whole life. And I just desire us to be people that yearn for the coming of Christ. If you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. In fact, it's proof that he loves you because you woke up today. Scripture says that your mer- the mercies are made new every day. He says that I pour out um, grace, or should I say yes, grace to, to the just and unjust. I bless the just and unjust. Like everyone is in an equal playing field because we're all sinners. But there is a difference. The difference is that one is child of, a child of God and the other is not. So if you find yourself in a place of, man, I don't know if I'm a child of God or, and I live my life as if I'm not, I'm going to ask you, man, today is the day of salvation And we just want to pray with you. And if you can, man, just slip up your hand so we can pray for you.
if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you just wish you want, you just want to make some changes in your life, and you know God's been calling you, you know that you didn't just walk into this place uh, by accident because it was divine appointment. No one wants to walk into a Bible study if they're living in the world. Like, you could have been doing something else, but God brought you here. So if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you feel it today, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be scared of. We just want to pray with you. If you can, just slip up your hand. Anybody in this room? We just want to pray with you. Amen. And so I pray that everybody in this room is saved. If God comes today, everybody, this room should be empty. Amen. Amen. When we see him, we have nothing to be ashamed about. There's nothing to be scared about. We die today. There's nothing to be scared about, right? Everybody confident in their faith? Yes, sir. Amen. If you have been living a lukewarm lifestyle, if you have backslidden, you knew Christianity or perhaps uh, you fell off. It's OK. We all fall off sometimes. Sometimes sin gets the best of us and you just need prayer. We just want to encourage you. It's OK if you pray, if you lift up your hand last week, it's OK. We just want to pray with you. If you can't lift up your hand right now so we could pray with you. Anybody in this room? Amen. My sister, I see you. Amen. My brother, I see you. Anybody else? Amen. My bro, I see you. Anybody else? And nothing to be scared about you. We, we're Christians. That's what we do. We pray for each other. The Bible called us to comfort and edify each other, meaning built up. Anybody wants to be built up in prayer? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. So those that raised their hand, they're waiting for you in the back. You already know the, 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 the routine. Just leave the pew. They're waiting for you to pray for you in the back. Even if you didn't raise your hand and you were scared to raise your hand, hey, the door is open. You can walk back there. Ain't nobody looking. You could, you could go ahead and just stroll right back there. They waiting for you. Amen, my sister. And for everybody else, let us pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this just man. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. I just think about, man, how you could have just, man, just allow us to die a long time ago, man. But yet you allowed us to come and sit in this pew, Lord Jesus, just to honor and worship you and just listen to your word, Father God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this message in itself, Lord Jesus, it just, it, it warns the body of Christ, man. I pray that we wake up, Lord. If the devil is so busy, man, the Christians should be even busier, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we are people that, that we don't compromise your message, Lord, Lord God. Like we're not afraid of man, Lord. Even when it, come, it becomes overbearing sometimes and, and, and the, per, the person seems persuasive or if, they, if we just want to be like Father God. I, man, I ask for forgiveness, Lord Jesus, if we compromise your gospel because we want to be liked, Lord. I pray for your people, Lord Jesus, that heard your word, whether online, through the podcast, whether in this place, Lord Jesus. I pray that this word, Father God, lands on good soil in the name of Jesus and it produces much fruit for the glory of God because we are living in the last days, Lord Jesus. Allow that to be embedded in our hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus, to be ready, Father God, to, to be people that study the scripture, Jesus. There are people that, man, that, that we don't just run for the, the first new thing or, or, or we just want to be liked or whatever it is, Lord God, that will compromise you and your, your, your virtues, Lord. I pray that we people, Lord Jesus, that love you more than we love the world, Lord. People that, that are submitted unto you, Lord Jesus. People that are quick to repent. People that are quick to pray. People that are quick to run to you before they run to the world, run to a bar, run to a club, run to a friend to gossip. Let's run to you and talk to you, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, even for this message, I pray that it, and it just pierces their hearts, their minds, that we people of expectancy, Lord. I pray that we're not quick to just, as soon as we say amen, we stroll on Instagram, we start talking, gossiping. We talk, I, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we have a high reverence for you. I pray that we live our life as if you're sitting right next to us, which according to scripture, you're living inside of us. So it should be a higher reverence, Lord. Allow us to acknowledge that. The Bible says that when we fall into sin, Lord, that we grieve the spirit, Lord Jesus. That word grieved means he cries as if someone died. Let us acknowledge, Lord Jesus, every time we sin, Lord, you're crying as if we died, Lord. But yet you died so we could be alive, Lord. Help us to live with that, Lord. 
And forgive us if we've forgotten salvation. Forgive us if we've forgotten the gospel. Forgive us if we took advantage of the gospel. Forgive us for putting you on the cross every day, day after day. Every time we sin, we're putting you right back on the cross. Forgive us, Lord. As Paul says, there is no other sacrifice while we keep sinning. We have no excuse, Jesus. So help us, Father God, to live with reverence, desire, discipline, and urgency, Jesus. Use us for the glory of God. Ignite us on fire. Allow us to be that remnant, Lord Jesus. That when everybody's going the opposite way, Father God, we stay on a straight and narrow, Lord. Despite the scoffing, despite what people say, my family members, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is, despite them, Lord Jesus, let us not compromise the gospel. Let us be living billboards like my shirt say, Jesus. When they see me, I always want them to see Jesus, not Hector, not fill in the blank. None of that, Lord. So we thank you. And I submit these unto you because they're your children first, Lord. In the mighty name of our Lord and Jesus. Amen, Lord.